Having made the decision, I felt relatively calm, but of course, uh, quite a lot of adrenaline. Um, I had to try to ensure that the early pace was correct. Um, Bracia went into the lead, and uh, I was a bit worried that he wasn't going fast enough. But I had I had done nothing for five days. I hadn't trained. I had, I just rested, and so I felt very full of running. And in the first lap, I was following him, and I said, "Faster, faster!" You know, an order. <laughs> And uh, uh, in fact, he was going at absolutely the right pace. It was just that I was so full of running that it didn't, I didn't feel that I was running fast. He ran the first uh, lap very correctly in 58. Uh, he took us uh, to the half mile in two minutes. Then Chatterway took over and he passed the three quarter mile in three minutes, exactly as planned. Uh, and then I knew that I had to, we were then slowing down, inevitably, and I had to do the last lap um, in, in under 60 seconds. Um, and that was quite fast, and I overtook uh, Chataway at the beginning of the uh, next to last bend, oh, the end of the last, uh, um, uh, end of that bend, overtook him, and then just had to run as fast as I could to the finish. I knew I was very close, but you get very tired and there's a certain amount of pain and you slow up. You think you're going faster, but your legs are so tired that you are in fact slowing. Um, I did collapse at the end, uh, big, partly because if you don't keep on running, um, keep your blood circulating, then you get a kind of failure. The muscles stop pumping the blood back and uh, you get dizzy. And I did uh, lose my sight for a bit because I, I was crowded in by um, everybody rushed onto the track. It was not a very uh, well-organized meeting. It was a very informal meeting. Uh, and then um, about um, a couple of minutes later, the announcement came and was made by a friend of mine called Norris McQuirter, who later became the editor of the Guinness Book of Records, a person who was very punctilious in the management of facts and information, and he made the announcement, uh, you know, the result of event four, the one mile, uh, was the Wimmer R.G. Bannister of Exeter and Merton Colleges uh, in a time which subject to ratification is um, a track record, an English native record, uh, a United Kingdom record, a European record, uh, in a time of three minutes. And then the whole of the um, track uh, exploded and nobody heard the rest of the announcement. So that was it. It was a great moment um, to do something, um, you know, supremely well. And I felt I was as well fitted to do it as I had ever been, and perhaps I might ever be. You know, you, I might have pulled a muscle um, a week before, and uh, I, I actually went climbing three weeks before because, you know, I, I was feeling fed up with running. And with Chris Brasher, who was a climber, we went off and quite crazily went uh, climbing um, in, uh, in Wales. And I, I could easily have sprained an ankle, but uh, it nevertheless um, released, um, you know, some kind of uh, energy that was getting jaded uh, so that I could uh, come back and, and go on improving up to the event. The reason sport is attractive to many of the general public, not to some intellectuals, is that it's filled with reversals. What you think may happen doesn't happen. Uh, a champion is beaten. An unknown becomes a champion. And I had set my mind on winning the 1500 meters gold medal in Helsinki 
1952. My ambition was always to do, say, what Lovelock had done and win a gold medal. And it all came disastrously wrong uh, when I came forth instead of winning. The, the reasons why I came forth are unimportant of I mean, it. It was a reorganization of the uh, pattern of the races. And my very slender training let me down. Mm. I did not have the uh, capacity to recover quickly. But still, it doesn't matter. Um, instead of retiring in order to devote myself to medicine, I decided to go on for another two years while I was still a student clinically, um, working clinically in London, and I did that. And the targets that would have justified, if you like, uh, this, as I saw it, um, failure, uh, were the Commonwealth Games, uh, which, or Empire Games as they were then called, we, we called it the Empire, we don't anymore. Uh, this was a race in Vancouver against uh, John Landy, or a lot of other runners, but he was the, the most, uh, most famous. The target of the four-minute mile then came into view. It was talked about in the 30s, and the Swedes got very close, uh, but it had just taken us after the war to gradually come down to a time closer. And uh, in 53, uh, which was... Uh, the year, if you remember, when Everest was climbed by a, a British and Commonwealth team, uh, I ran four minutes, three seconds, and I felt the next year it should be possible. It was my last year anyway, and so I trained hard through the winter with two friends, Chris Chataway and Chris Brasher, uh, Brasher from Cambridge, Chataway from Oxford, and uh, they helped with the pacemaking, and uh, really made it possible because you can only break a time uh, really by running evenly. Um, it's a question of spreading the available energy, um, aerobic and anaerobic, evenly over four minutes. If you run one part very much too fast, you pay a price. You run another part more slowly, your overall time is slower. So that was really the secret. and. Uh, uh, Chris Brasher led for two laps, Chris Chataway led for one lap and a bit more, and then I took over. John Landy, my rival, ran four minutes and two seconds, um, three or four times, and he used the phrase, it's like a wall. Um, now, logically, I could not understand, as a physiologist, um, why uh, a human being can run a mile in four minutes and two seconds and four minutes and one second, and why somebody else won't inevitably come along, train a little better, know that there's a target to be beaten, um, and beat it. So that was my mental approach to it. It was just fortunate for me that the pathway of record breaking, which continues in all aspects of athletics, had just reached this magical, critical four minutes, four laps of uh, one minute each uh, on a, a, a quarter mile track. That was really the reason why it had conspired to become a possible barrier, physical or psychological. Uh, it wasn't, in my view, physical, but it did become, to some extent, psychological. And it was really... Um, uh, an example, I don't know whether the word paradigm is, is correct, a uh, paradigm of human achievement uh, in a purely athletic sense. What limits are there? I went into um, my hospital um, in London, St Mary's, uh, and I didn't do rounds, but I, I was not that, uh, I was a clinical student. But what I did was I went into the um, physiological um, technician's lab and I sharpened the spikes because those were sticky tracks made of electricity uh, ash with oil in them. and your spikes, which were really quite long then, not to say on that, would, would, would catch the 
uh, material of the track and your shoe would get heavier. <laughs> and I was simply uh, uh, filing them down and rubbing some graphite on the, sh on the spikes so that I uh, thought I would run more effectively. I then got a train up to Oxford. I then had lunch with some uh, long-term friends and then spent the rest of the afternoon uh, looking at the weather and uh, going through. It was so strange, really, uh, to be able to m withhold the decision. You might think that, uh, that you have to have it in your mind. He actually honed on doing it uh, continuously. But in my case, that wasn't true. I would have entered the race because I couldn't disappoint people. Mm -hmm. But I would have disappointed them because I would not have made a record attempt. Uh, to make a record attempt and fail and exhaust yourself, because I was the kind of runner who trained so little that I couldn't race within another 10 days if I had put all my hopes into it and energy into it. So, so that, was, that, that was the problem. The particular background was, was a race in May in which our athletic association uh, competed against the university. So there was an event and you cannot break world records unless it's in an established event and you have three timekeepers and the whole thing is organized. The real problem was that May is a very early time in the year and the weather is usually bad. And uh, you cannot run a fast mile race if there is a strong wind, because uh, the wind, although it may be behind you part of the time, it makes your running uneven. And the only way that you can uh, achieve a, a four minute mile is to run it as evenly paced as possible so that your energy expenditure is spread out and you mix your aerobic and anaerobic um, uh, energy supplies in a, an appropriate and efficient way. So um, the opportunity was there. The question was, was the weather, which was very bad, it had been raining and was very windy, such that it was impossible to do it? And to try to do something when external circumstances make it impossible would A, have um, you know, made me feel that it was a more difficult task. Maybe there is a, a barrier about, um, about four, four minutes. My colleagues, um, Chris Chatterway and Chris Brasher, who had agreed were running on my side in the race against the university, had agreed to set a reasonable pace. And would I be able to get them to cooperate on some future occasion? Or might John Landy, who had then gone to uh, Finland to be given the perfect opportunities and pacing, would he do it first? So about 20 minutes before the race. The weather seemed to improve. I said, let's do it. And uh, so there we are. That was the setting. When I decided that it, the weather, I had to take the chance. Um, the, the real thought in my mind, by then I did have a coach, Frank Stamford. And uh, he, uh, we met by chance in, in the train. I mean, I hadn't planned to do it. And he said, if the weather is bad, what you have to remember is that, A, I think you can run it in 356, which is what a coach would say, so I, I didn't pay too much attention to that. But the second thing he said is that if you have the, an opportunity, not a perfect opportunity, and you don't take it, you may never have another chance. And it was that thought, I think, which eventually led me to attempt it. I was always a great bundle of energy. And uh, as a child, instead of walking, I would run. And so running, which is a pain to a lot of people, was always a pleasure to me because it was so easy. And uh, I wanted to have some success. I, I came from quite a simple origin um, without uh, any great privilege. And I'd say I also wanted to make a mark. And it wasn't, I suppose, until I was about 15 that I 
appeared in a race. I was playing rugby and the other games English school children do, and there was an event which was planned uh, in which uh, races were run, and I simply just won these by a very considerable margin. And so everybody thought, oh, this is rather special. I was self-motivated um, and uh, driven to try to do um, the things I attempted as successfully as possible. So in relation to sport, I tried to do that as well as possible, um, but at the same time remained primarily a medical student uh, with quite wide interests, uh, which I'm sure was the result of my parental influence. Um, and then uh, quite quickly had decided I wanted to be a neurologist. Uh, that seemed to be the most difficult, um, the most intriguing, the most important aspect uh, of medicine, which had links brain function with uh, psycholo psychology, uh, aggression, behavior, uh, human affairs, and uh, so that was my choice. I did play other sports in English schools. You were expected to, so I played rugby uh, at school. I did some bit of rowing at school, but I didn't have a real skill in ball games. I was adequate enough to be in school teams, some school teams, but running was really quite a separate skill, and I enjoyed with my impatience, I think I enjoyed running uh, to get about more quickly, and I never found it any effort. And uh, so I was training myself um, when I uh, went to school in Bath. I lived on the top of one hill, and the school was at the top of another hill. Nobody ever went to school by car. We didn't have any cars during war, so that to and from school was itself a training which you might think is now the equivalent of a Kenyan farmer <laughs> who spends a lot of time when in child he has eight miles to go to school and then as, as he grows up he looks after the herds. So you know my, my childhood was a vigorous one. They were supportive but at the time I was um, about to break a world record and already uh, become well known, my, my, my mother used to say, well, it's all very well, this running business, but I hope it doesn't distract you from your work as a medical student. <laughs> I mean, and uh, so in, in other words, um, I got the impression that for her, the only important thing was for me to become a doctor, which, uh, as it were, was a career which had not been possible in, in her, her generation, in her society. So the, the values were career medicine, um, sport something other, something to be set aside. I, I was self-motivated. Um, and uh, driven to try to do um, the things I attempted as successfully as possible. So in relation to sport, I tried to do that as well as possible, um, but at the same time remained primarily a medical student uh, with quite wide interests, uh, which I'm sure was the result of my parental influence, um, and then uh, quite quickly had decided I wanted to be a neurologist. Uh, that seemed to be the most difficult, um, the most intriguing, the most important aspect uh, of medicine, which had links, brain function with uh, psycholo psychology, uh, aggression, behavior, uh, human affairs, and uh, so that was my choice. I was determined um, sometimes to the point of riskiness. You know, I wanted to, there was an incident, I wanted to 
go rowing uh, on the River Severn near Bewdley. And the person who hired out the boat said, no, it's too rough. Um, you know, it's not safe to go out. And I made such a pest of myself that um, my father said, all right, you know, we will go out. And uh, <laughs> it, it proved to be uh, dangerous and frightening, but um, that's an instance of the determination I had to try to do things. And later on, if there was uh, the opportunity to climb a mountain mm -hmm. or to uh, go ballooning or some adventurous activity, I would always be keen to do it. And it's perhaps fortunate that nothing ever went wrong. <laughs> but my discovery in Bath was of the countryside. I loved the countryside. I cycled um, from the age of sort of 10 to 15 all around um, Bath and Somerset and Cheddar Gorge and uh, the sites of castles and country houses. Um, and I remember that as a time of freedom, um, uh, often perhaps a bit solitary, but a great excitement of discovery and exploration. Running was something that I wanted to do at school, so I became a champion at school. And then my father, when I was 16, took me to watch uh, an athletic event. There are two parts about to running. There is the simple enjoyment as you run through the countryside and a pure pleasure without any uh, target. And it, this uh, meeting showed me a, a, a kind of forum in which uh, success could be crystallized. Those who were watching applauded, uh, and there was a, a gladiatorial interplay between the athletes. And I watched an English runner called Sidney Woodison, who had held the world record for the mile, and that it had always been a British preoccupation to hold this mile record, or a series of English runners who had held it. And I watched him uh, after the end of the war in 1945, running against the world record holders from Sweden, the Anna Andersen. And he was not in the same league, but he came up and challenged the world record holder uh, on the last bend. Um, the, the challenge was easily fought off by the Swede, but there was a feeling of the courage that he showed in tackling a Swede who looked physically much stronger, more elegant, more powerful. Woodson was a rather small man. But this exchange, this battle, was, I think, the thing which uh, it led me to go on from simple running for pleasure, the running with this target of uh, records, uh, Olympic Games, and other events in mind. Well, I read lots of books um, when I was sort of 15, 14, 15, 16 about medicine, and I suppose Nobel laureates and Madame Curie and Pasteur, mm -hmm. these were the uh, role models, if you like, uh, but uh, I also had, at that stage, um, athletic ambitions, and the role model uh, for my athletic ambitions was um, Sidney Woodison, who had held the world record uh, for the mile uh, just before the war, and uh, my father uh, had never had a chance to become a runner, and although he didn't make a great deal of it, um, he did take me at the end of the war to the White City Stadium to watch a race in which Woodison was running against the great Swedish runners. Wow. Uh, Woodison didn't win, but it was inspiring to see this runner, much shorter than the Swedes, come up and challenge the Swedes, who had had all the benefits of uh, peacetime for them during the war, better food, 
no rationing, uh, challenge and uh, run very, um, well, very movingly decent and decently. Yeah. And uh, that, if you like, was uh, the moment when I said, well, that would be something I should like to do. Essentially, muscles contain two sorts of fibre. They are called simply fast twitch and slow twitch fibres, and we have a mixture of them, and that's genetic. But you can, by training, um, alter the balance of some of the intermediate fibres, make more fast ones or make more slow ones, according to the training you do. Yeah. Um, so the sprinters have more fast twitch fibres and concentrate on developing them, distance runners uh, have um, more slow twitch fibres. And um, obviously I was born with more slow twitch fibres, but the whole of my training was developed, uh, the, they're developing these fibres. Mm. Um, if you like, there's another parallel that to move oxygen to the muscles is what enables them to release energy to run or anything else. Uh, if you uh, are running for 20 seconds, there is no time for any oxygen to get from the outside air through your lungs to the muscles. So you're entirely dependent on what's called anaerobic breakdown of energy without the presence of air and oxygen. That's why you feel breathless at the end of it and you just cannot go at that speed for longer than 15 seconds. Mm. These other fibres uh, are very efficient. They contract more slowly, but they can go on contracting because the air is provided. The mile requires about 50% of the energy is anaerobic, 50% is aerobic. So you've got a balance between the two, and that's why it's a fascinating race. I mean, you see people sprinting at the end of it, uh, if they've got enough energy to do so. Mm. And then as the distance increases, then the need for anaerobic fibres and fast twitch fibres gets less and less. I found longer races boring. I found the mile just perfect. But my introduction to track racing was through the background of enjoying cross-country running, ah. which is not a sport perhaps as popular in America, in the United States, as it is in England. But cross-country running, steeplechasing is what it's called informally, um, is very popular. I enjoyed doing that, and I was quite good at that. But I, I wasn't quite as good um, as I had proved to be as a miler. The adolescent who is totally and perfectly adjusted to his environment, I've yet to meet. <laughs> and now with grandchildren who are going through adolescence, uh, I, I see it so clearly. Um, I was um, uh, lonely in the sense that uh, we lived in a, a suburban street and uh, my parents, having come uh, from Lancashire, uh, which is the north of England, um, didn't automatically fit in with the people who were southerners, I'll put it that way. And uh, they were quite self-contained people themselves. They were interested in self-improvement and education. And uh, so I think I was uh, perhaps set on a, a this uh, more, rather more lonely track, but I didn't have any difficulty uh, finding and having friends. And, I suppose the real opening for me uh, was passing um, into Oxford, um, which um, was then and still is, um, with Cambridge, our major universities, uh, with only a relatively small intake, and so there were competitive exams in order to achieve that. My concentration was um, really on getting to university, and becoming a doctor mm. and possibly through my parental influence nothing really deflected me from taking my work seriously. I think uh, they let me know that they expected it of me, that uh, school marks were important 
Um, they certainly laughed at jokes, but there was an underlying seriousness. Yeah. Uh, life uh, had a purpose, uh, and uh, achievement was something which came by hard work. Um, my father and my mother had not been to a university, so it was the generation, in their generation, probably two or three percent of the population went to university. Um, it's now rising in this country uh, 40 percent, uh, maybe even higher in, in the United States. So in order to go to university, as they had never been themselves, they assumed that it was a rather serious trial and that uh, if uh, school studies were not taken seriously, then uh, you were unlikely to get to university. So that was a kind of watershed. You either go to university or you don't. And then, of course, uh, I had known of Oxford, um, and the object was to get to Oxford rather than other universities. And uh, that itself, of course, uh, uh, was quite a hurdle. In English schools, you have a major examination when you are 14 or 15. I took it rather early at 14, and I did do the best of, of, of my school in these examinations. They're public examinations, um, and uh, so that was a good start. And I then managed to transfer, because the war was ending, to a, um, a more established school in London, um, which, of course, gave me a better chance of um, getting to Oxford, because I was then being prepared for the leaving uh, examinations, Examination. which are at, uh, at, at, at 17 or 18, and I was already accelerated. And so, perhaps inappropriately, when I didn't feel, again, I was uh, getting on with things, I was impatient. So I actually went to Cambridge when I was 16 for a scholarship examination, uh, very young, and they said, well, we'll have you in a year's time. Postpone it a year. We mm. would want to have you. And I was sufficiently impatient to then go to Oxford, and uh, Oxford said, we'll take you straight away. So that's actually the reason why I went to Oxford okay. rather than Cambridge. I toyed as most um, 16, 17 year olds uh, with the idea of uh, psychology, uh, but uh, I found that unsatisfactory. It was dealing with problems of rats solving mazes and matters of statistic. It was very experimental psychology, and uh, I turned quite swiftly into physiology, which had a firm basis and uh, did a research degree after my ordinary degree, uh, an MSc degree in physiology, the physiology of exercise and breathing. And uh, while I was in Oxford, the medicine came first, but I also, as is not uncommon or was un not uncommon then, um, got what's called my blue for winning the mile race against Cambridge and uh, became president of the athletic club, was involved in building a track. I mean, students play a larger part in the administration of sports in Oxford. Took a team uh, of Oxford and Cambridge athletes to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cornell. Had my first exposure to the wonders of the United States. Well, we didn't win the field events, the heavy events, we won some of the sprints and we won the mile. So uh, it, was, uh, it was very interesting, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Um, you must remember that um, at that stage, uh, people had very rarely flown. And uh, in a way, uh, one of the incentives to be a, a world athlete was that it gave me the freedom to travel. Um, in those austerity days, I think the amount that could be spent on foreign travel, because our currencies were denuded after fighting the war, were 25 pounds. So you can't have much of a foreign holiday on 25 um, pounds. So really it was the 
entree to world travel as an athlete, uh, which was most important. We had a ration of, of cheese and meat and, uh, and so on. Uh, we took into breakfast in the college our own rations on a little plate. Uh, it was quite serious. I mean, um, he, he, uh, winning a war, <laughs> America and Britain and so on, winning the World War, it was, um, it was a very difficult time. And uh, the government of the day uh, chose to tax heavily uh, in order to start social services, but decided to keep on these restrictions. And they went on for nine years after the war. But I think if you are young, and I didn't come from an affluent home, I was never really expecting um, uh, affluence. I mean, food was very simple. I can't remember uh, people didn't go out to meals and so on, and restaurants, you know, life was very simple. And uh, my parents had come from the north of England, which is a fairly uh, rugged, uh, bleak, hard-working uh, part of England. Um, and uh, so there was not the expectation of luxury. I would say that my athleticism was really the core to social acceptance because in those days the overwhelming number of students uh, came from a uh, more public school background. But I actually arrived in Oxford in 1946, which was when a large number of ex-servicemen came back. And they had deferred entry to university in order to fight during the war. And so there were only a few of us, um, I don't know, 10% of us, who uh, were accepted for medicine um, uh, with um, awards to come up, who were integrated into this group of men, uh, almost exclusively men, there were women's colleges, but they were only a fifth of the total of Oxford. Um, and we were alongside veterans who, you know, wore medals and, uh, um, uh, and had been injured. And some of them, of course, had been relatively senior, promoted senior to senior ranks, um, you know, by losses on the battlefield. So it was a very strange time. And, in, in a sense, we had nothing in common with them uh, except uh, sport. And, and if we happened to be uh, good at sport, then they would pay a little more attention. They were very kind. I mean, yes, they never right. made us feel inferior in that sense. So there was the social situation to which I had to make a fairly major adjustment, uh, a situation in which um, sort of money was, was tight. Uh, but also uh, the, the sporting adjustment. But quite quickly, it wouldn't have been true in rowing, perhaps, uh, in which you had to be bigger and heavier and stronger. It wouldn't have been true in rugby. But in athletics, um, it was possible to uh, be uh, recognized. And really, quite quickly, I was even you know, made president of the club, although I was probably one of the youngest uh, members of the club. And that, that really opened up so many doors, made me feel much more at ease, um, and having uh, duties such as fall on a president of a club and traveling with them and helping to organize events. And then eventually, actually, we rebuilt an old uh, three lap to the mile track in Oxford. So mm. all these things happened and made Oxford a wonderful turning point, um, irrespective of the firm basis of scientific medicine which it Indeed. gave me, it changed my life totally. Oxford um, was a very intriguing place. Um, you had a whole range of talented people who were trying to be good at things. Uh, Kenneth Tynan was, was acting, uh, there were uh, politicians uh, like uh, 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 Rees Mogg and, and others who were debating. Um, and uh, everybody then, except a few dilettantes who abhorred exercise or pretended to, took part in sport. The um, 
academic programs were organized so that there weren't fixed lectures um, in the afternoons. Um, as a, doc, a medical student, we had more um, classes than, and lectures than other people. Uh, but um, uh, Oxford um, has a series of 25 different colleges and uh, in the afternoons um, each college would have teams for every sport uh, and they would compete in, 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 in inter-college events uh, for cups and prizes. And uh, rather to everybody's surprise, uh, I was put in a team. It was a, a dreadful winter in 1947. It's historically, there has never been a winter like it since. And the track was frozen and they couldn't have trials. And so uh, I couldn't prove that I could be in the team. Uh, my previous best time was uh, about five minutes, you know, in, in a one freshman's race. And, but I'd been seen shoveling away the snow rather uh, vigorously. And so the captains and sport is entirely run by students in Oxford. The, the captain said, well, look, just as a third string, that means the, the third runner who is not expected to do anything, why don't we put him in? And uh, they put me in, and then on the race itself, I just overtook uh, all the rest of the field um, and won, which is a time which was 30 seconds faster than I'd done before, but very modest, of course, uh, four and a half minutes. And that was the beginning of an eight-year process in which every year I improved and then um, after eight years I was near the world record and then on the, in the eighth year broke it, um, had qualified as a doctor six weeks later, uh, tidied up one or two other races because my record was broken by an Australian, John Landy, and then John Landy and I had to compete head to head in what was then called the Empire Games, when we still had a bit of an empire, and is now the Commonwealth Games, and I then defeated him. So, um, as a word, honour was satisfied. I had another European race and then retired, and never ran again competitively. I received a, a scholarship, um, you know, to can stay in Oxford, and there was a possibility of my becoming a physiologist or scientist, but mm -hmm. I didn't think my mathematics was good enough, and um, I wanted to be all the, or, already um, a neurologist, and I felt that that was the area of medicine which I was, which I was most interested, and I decided to go to London to do the clinical work. And so uh, I left in 1951, and then spent three years at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School, which was the medical school um, where Fleming invented uh, um, penicillin, yeah. discovered penicillin. Um, well, Chain and Florey and Oxford were part of the, uh, of, of the development eventually, but still, it was a well-known medical school. And it so happened that there was a well-known runner who'd been there, who had come from the same college in Oxford. He was a Rhodes Scholar called Jack Lovelock, and he won the uh, Berlin Olympic 1500 meter race by a wide margin. So, so he was someone, uh, if you like, who proved to be also a model. I must be the international athlete who trained least. <laughs> In other words, I had worked out from my knowledge of physiology what was the minimum amount of training that would be needed to continue to improve year by year. And uh, every year, I suppose, I would be reducing my mile best time by two or three seconds, you know, starting 418 and then gradually, gradually coming down. And basically, I was doing interval rate training. I had so many other interests that I wanted to have my evenings free, and I would usually miss lunch 
uh, and sometimes there were rather unimportant lectures uh, at 12 o'clock. So for example, I knew I wasn't going to be an obstetrician, and there were certain areas of medicine which could be reduced to formulae. You know, uh, there are six complications of this condition, and uh, once you had uh, mastered that, uh, it was uh, not too difficult, or you had to deliver some babies and things. But So I, I would tend to take about two hours off uh, to travel to a track, um, spend about 35 minutes running, but running very hard, and then just have a shower, didn't warm up, didn't warm down, had a shower, would get some, something to eat and get back to the hospital uh, by um, uh, two o'clock. So that was really the pattern for, for, for several years, um, with, of course, intervals for traveling to matches and, and teams. So it was a major incursion into my medical studies. And I think that although I passed all my examinations first time and so on, I did not pay as much attention in depth to clinical medicine as I had to my physiology. But um, I, in, the, in the long term, I simply had to catch up after qualifying uh, by studying for the various higher exams which our specialist physicians and neurologists need to do. My main interest was to lead a happy social life, to uh, catch up, if you like, on, on the areas of friendship and uh, interaction which had not been a part of my early childhood, which is why I had been bored as a child, but now there was too much to do. Um, and uh, as someone who was then uh, nationally and internationally known, there were all kinds of opportunities to meet people and to do broadcasts and to uh, engage in the facets of life which had never really been within my ken um, a few years earlier. The broader perspective was really what, what appealed to me. Um, uh, having to train uh, once a day um, was a price I had to pay for the entry to a wonderful world mm. um, in which um, England being a smaller country uh, and so many people living perhaps in London um, the, the stage and um, music and um, acting and writing all seemed part of the scene. Mm. And it was a scene in which I wanted to become involved, although peripherally, because it was part of the most exciting learning pro process. And uh, I think all my life I've wanted to go on learning. I'm still wanting to go on learning. There was one journalist who said eventually the four-minute mile will be broken and everybody thought this was a pretty eccentric view because there was a long way to go. But um, to me, at that stage, I was only looking ahead to becoming an international. Um, I was immediately involved in the uh, management of the Oxford Athletics, became the secretary and then the president. and. Uh, I de declined the invitation to compete in the London Olympics. But the, in those days, I didn't train very much. We didn't really know how to train in modern terms. And uh, there was this thing called burning yourself out. And I didn't want to burn myself out at 18. And I had a notion that if I looked after myself, trained carefully, I would go on improving, not by training two to three hours a day, but by training three quarters of an hour a day. It seemed to me logical uh, that you could go on improving and you didn't have to spend all the day running. There was a coach, but I fell out with him. He said, you do this. And I said, why do I do this? And he said, well, you do this because I'm the coach and I tell you to do it. And uh, he'd make me do a time trial. 
um, and he'd be holding a watch. And I'd say, uh, you know, what time did I do? And he said, oh, don't worry about that. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll win it. So although he'd been quite well known, he was actually a coach to um, someone called Jack Lovelock, who won the Olympic 1500 meters in Berlin in 1936. But, um, you know, I suppose I was always independent. Um, and uh, I felt about running that it was my task to find out what suited me, what didn't suit me, how much training could I do, um, and then uh, improve my performance and not let my performance go down because I was training too hard. And uh, These were things which seemed to me so individual that nobody else was going to understand me to this degree. His name, name was Bert Thomas. I mean, he had a, um, uh, a waistcoat, if you know what a waistcoat is, <laughs> a suit and a bowler hat. <laughs> so really archaic. Um, but um, yeah, you see, if you're doing a technical event like high jumping or hurdling, putting the shot, um, all those things, you have to have a coach. Oh, in, in, I mean, we had coaches, but in Oxford, it was actually the most senior athlete whose job it was to teach the others. It was uh, as informal as that. And then, of course, later it became more professional. But that was the reason why I pursued a rather lonely furrow. Um, and I made the decision that I wouldn't compete in the Olympic Games. Uh, and I reached a position in which I was being criticized in the press for not racing often enough. They said, here's this chap, you know, and uh, we think he's good. We want to see him. And I said, well, no, I mean, I, I run if I want to run. There's nobody paying me to run. If I think that five races a year is the right, and if I feel that um, I'll work up towards the peak in the middle uh, of the season, um, that's what I'm going to do. But the, it, everything came unstuck in a very big way because I pursued this kind of uh, approach with a lot of press criticism. And eventually they said, well, OK, you know, uh, if he wins the gold medal in Helsinki in 1952, um, he'll be right. He, he's, he's done the right thing. And um, just um, three weeks before the Helsinki Olympics, the management of the events in the Olympic Games is left to local Helsinki, in this case, organizers. And uh, it, it was said afterwards that there had been um, a rather deliberate attempt, because I was the favorite, to change the program. And they had three races on three successive days, which were unnecessary. Previously, there always been the heats, a day's rest or two days rest and a final. And that was what I was planning for and I could have co co coped with it. But by the third day of these successive races, I didn't run. I knew in my heart that it was a virtually impossible task for me. Uh, and of course, with that frame of mind too, it did prove impossible. I came fourth, uh, no British gold medals. Uh, in the Helsinki Olympics, except for a horse called Fox Hunter, who won one, an equestrian event, disaster, criticism for Bannister. We told him he should train differently, and now it, it's proved. Um, if I had won the gold medal, I would probably have retired, because, you know, Olympic gold medal, 59 meters, there's nothing, nothing higher and would we just go on with our work. But I felt angry uh, with the press, angry with myself, angry with the organizers of the event, and um, thought about it, uh, and knew that I could go on for two more years when the equivalent of an Olympic prize would have been the European Championships and uh, the Commonwealth Games, and that would have um, meant most of the great runners, not, not unfortunately the American runners, but the rest of the world would have been represented. And so after thought, I decided it would be possible to work and go on training. It proved difficult.
Well, I had a common sense knowledge about what was needed. Um, and uh, as a, a scientist, and I was a physiologist and did some research, you know, before I went on to my clinical training, um, with trial and error, that's what science is. Uh, to me, running was an experiment. Uh, here were muscles, uh, here was a heart, here were lungs. Uh, to what extent can this bit of machinery uh, be trained to do a very specific, skilled task. Um, and uh, I knew that the training had to fit the event. How do you manage to release uh, physical and nervous energy over four minutes? Uh, running marathons wasn't going to help. Running seven miles wasn't going to help. So that was really the, the only part in which my medical training helped me. It was a, a, a matter of applying logic to the problem. All sporting events are, are more mental than physical. Um, you have to train the physical aspects for years, but eventually even in, in the more complex uh, movements, which have my respect, those who can pitch and bat or play golf and so on, um, the basis of it is laid down in the brain. And the real question is whether the brain can be allowed to do its bit without being interfered with by psychological factors. The other aspect is of the brain is that it must be positive. Um, I suppose this is, these two are connected, but the brain has to have some overall image of what is being achieved. And I did have a feeling that, in a, in a sense, uh, looking down on myself doing it. I mean, being outside uh, my body um, in, in some kind of way, and I think this experience has been described by others. No, because um, the two were separate. My core of my whole life was medicine. And so I wanted to become a specialist. So for 10 years, um, I concentrated solely on medicine. It took 10 years to become a, a consultant in neurology. I had a spell in the army, which was necessary then. Um, and it wasn't really until I, 15 years later, I was asked to be the chairman of the British Sports Council. And that's really been the pattern since, that alongside my neurology, I have always had some public involvement in sport and sports promotion. Um, immediately after uh, I retired and uh, was um, a resident. I had that by then married and had started having a family. And um, I remember that my salary um, was uh, 800 pounds a year in residency uh, with the deductions for laundry. And uh, so I was fortunate enough uh, to be able to write and I wrote uh, regularly for leading English newspaper, The Sunday Times, and um, uh, wrote about um, uh, all, all other subjects than pure sport, mainly art sport, and went to the Olympics and wrote also regularly for Sports Illustrated, whose first edition was brought out on, on the occasion of my race against John Landy in Vancouver in the um, Empire Games. I wrote a book which was to get off my chest a number of, of uh, justifications or complaints or ideas and idealism about what running could mean for people who needed to find something for themselves in adolescence which um, gave them a feeling that life was moving forwards and not backwards. So I wrote the book and the book was well, well received. Uh, and having, I wrote it quickly in about six weeks, that was the end as far as I 
um, calculated at that point uh, of my running career. Of course, I came back later to uh, do government work in relation to encouraging sport, sport for others. But, but now I had to sink to the bottom of the pile, uh, graduating as a medical student, and I had to do my residences, and it was a very difficult time uh, in which I had to turn down all the engagements, mm -hmm. uh, work for these further exams, catching up on things that I had not been diligent enough to pursue earlier, uh, and my colleagues and my teachers of course, had some difficulties in dealing with me because uh, I was uh, famous, mm -hmm. notorious, <laughs> infamous, whichever phrase you like to use. And the concept that I could also have a serious career, and indeed in a very high com highly competitive field like neurology, mm -hmm. was really rather strange to them. Uh, there were those who supported me but I certainly felt I was being examined rather carefully and had to be more careful than others to start writing medical papers and pass the exams uh, as speedily as I could and uh, select the appointments. And there's something quite individual about the way somebody specializing tries to work at particular hospitals with particular individuals in order to increase his experience in the clinical field. Now we're now talking uh, now of clinical medicine, looking after patients, uh, understanding diseases which are growing points, trying to find some area within the field you're, you have chosen where there's a possible advance to be made. That is essentially what young uh, uh, clinical neurologists are attempting to do. So uh, this progressed. I had to spend two years in the army, which um, I managed to um, distort uh, in my favor by uh, using my physiological background to find out why unacclimatized troops were dying in uh, the Middle East. We had a problem in the Middle East, post-Suez with Aden, um, Aden uh, being the place where uh, a recent uh, United States um, naval vessel was uh, blown, blown up. So uh, that was a partial distraction, but I wrote some papers about heat illness, so all the time uh, trying to make the best of what opportunities were presented. And this uh, takes me really through a visit uh, for a year to Harvard to get mm -hmm. further training. And at the age of 33, mm -hmm. I am a consultant, appointed a consultant at two major London hospitals. And uh, in those days, certainly in a small country, um, neurology being, if you like, a super specialty, often the patients would be sent to London um, those that were, were not acutely sick. So that evolved, but the most important uh, point that I should mm -hmm. make, that after retiring from the track, I got married in 1955, and uh, we started to have a family. Mm -hmm. My wife had three children by the time we went to America. So this was a time of, of consolidation, um, family life, which I could only share to a limited extent because I was still doing my residency appointments mm. and my children remember me on holidays, so-called, you know, working at books and I'd accepted the editorship of a neurological textbook. And so those were years of very hard work, but very happy years uh, because my life was expanding through um, my wife and my family, but she had to work very hard and we turned down invitations all the time, which was rather frustrating. Very difficult. And it would not have been possible if she had not been the, uh, the person who was able to, to take over the whole of that side of, 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 um, of family life.
Well, sport is simple. It's black and white. It's very limited. Uh, medicine is complex, uh, indescribably difficult. It involves uh, collaboration. There aren't lonely peaks. I mean, there are Nobel laureates who uh, work on one particular subject in isolation and uh, are so clever that they are able to perceive what others cannot. And I was, of course, not that kind of a scientist. And clinical medicine is not like that. Mm -hmm. And I knew this. I knew it and I chose it because I felt that the capacity to apply yourself, to be alert to new developments, and to be prepared to spend the time uh, writing papers um, uh, would lead to a fascinating life in which a reputation would be created for hard work, for uh, one hopes kindness and effectiveness in dealing with um, patients and clinical problems, and then ultimately the kind of problems of organizing uh, medical committees and having a responsibility uh, th thrust upon one by colleagues who wished one to undertake um, particular duties of this kind. So gradually administration begins to come into the equation. But after a, um, a car accident, uh, when I was uh, 45, uh, which I um, had quite severe injuries. It wasn't my fault, but there we are. I was, a, I, I, I was badly injured. And I had a time to rethink. And I was then getting too busy in too many directions. I was um, being asked to see more private patients and so on. And I made the conscious decision then that I wouldn't do any more private practice and there was already an area of research, the autonomic nervous system, which was relatively neglected. It was between cardiology and neurology, and these areas in between are often the province of neither specialty, and so can lag behind. And uh, that was the area I chose, and this changed the second half of my life, if you like, because I then set up a laboratory, at that stage, there were not um, methods of testing that had been proved. So we proved these methods of testing, had a battery of tests. We saw all kinds of patients who might have these kinds of diseases. And at the same time, what was fortuitous was that uh, the method of assaying uh, the chemicals like noradrenaline that are released by nerve endings were being developed. So one also had a direct biochemical way of measuring the activity of this system. And uh, I developed it with colleagues in London, at the same time at uh, NIH uh, in Bethesda, they were also doing it. So I was able to feel in this kind of way mm. that I was near a leading edge um, and uh, set up autonomic research society in this country. And gradually, there are similar uh, research societies in other countries. And uh, uh, later, there was a, a research society of the same type in the United States. Uh, and at this time, I was traveling very widely um, and uh, speaking um, um, at medical conferences on these kind of areas. So there had been a consolidation, uh, which was uh, uh, satisfying and interesting, and I wrote a textbook which was the first textbook of um, disease of the autonomic nervous system. Mm. I mean, it was not an area that warranted a textbook, and uh, that's now gone on, and with a co-author, it's now in its fourth edition. Britain and the government have always been interested, even um, going back 50 or 60 years, in the public's attention to recreation. It's thought to be part of a full life. And yet, through uh, poverty or through other priorities, uh, the general population have not had the opportunity to take part in sport. 
There are very few swimming pools and sports centers and uh, affluence, lack of affluence meant they couldn't travel. So a sports council was set up in 1964, and I was a member of that original council, uh, to remedy these defects. And then I became the chairman of it when it was given independence, like our Arts Council. And this is a kind of public involvement which does not exist in the United States. But that has continued to evolve and uh, although I was uh, served my term as chairman, I would periodically um, chair some committees that would look at various problems, like uh, whether university students uh, had the opportunity to take part in sports. So that has continued to be a very important part of, part of my life. And um, in a way, may be of more significance long term than um, anything else. Um, mm. we, we started a campaign called Sport for All. That was a slogan, but it drew attention to the fact that sport should not be the province of any small group. And uh, we weren't concerned as much with Olympic gold medals as with the opportunities for all, but the two interact. If everyone has a chance, then those who have particular skills and I remembered this from my own youth, may be more likely to burst their way through, through their ambition and hard work. And uh, this process has continued, and uh, we've just had the Olympic Games in Sydney, mm -hmm. and for a small country, um, we have been surprisingly successful. Um, it's uh, not being jingoistic to want your country to do, do well. well. Uh, but, and this is just another uh, final aspect, that I am very worried about the professionalism corruption which has uh, um, followed professionalism and the abuse um, of drugs. And when I was chairman of this sports council, we set up the first um, testing program for anabolic steroids, still the testing that's used, but there are other drugs that have come along uh, which the athletes now take, only at the top. I'm not talking about uh, the mass of the joggers and the marathon runners, but at the top they take these drugs. And I am critical that the International Olympic uh, and other world bodies have not been as diligent as they should have been in trying to keep the testing up to date. It's been bad news for them and for their organizations and their sponsorship. So I feel strongly about that.